there are two creation stories in Genesis. And they follow one right after the other. And I love this part right here because in this story, this is where we find out that God is non-binary. Now, are you, are you ready for a Hebrew lesson? We're talking about gender today, so obviously we were going to have a Hebrew lesson. This story, this first creation story, uses God, Elohim in Hebrew. The second creation story uses God's name, which generally gets translated as Lord or the Lord in English. In Hebrew, we generally say Adonai, literally my Lord, instead of God's name. But this story uses God. Now, there's a shorter word, El, that also means God, as, a, as in a generic God. And that word is singular. But the interesting thing about the word Elohim is that it's a plural word. And it's used in the singular to refer to God, the God, the one God. Now in Hebrew and in many languages, every word has a gender. So we end up with a lot of God, he language, right? But we know that in English, we can use a singular they. In this story, we know that the word we use for God is plural. And it tells us that God made humanity in their own image. Male and female, God made them. There is male and female in God. God is non-binary. And we are made in God's own image. Beloveds, you are divine. You carry a divine spark. We should be using they for God. Now, this story was written in a time and for a people who understood human gender as binary and in a culture that was a patriarchy. We are able to expand beyond only male and female today. We know scientifically, we know biologically that a gender binary is a construct. I'm gonna ask Gray to put a link in the Twitter chat. Did I say Twitter chat? I'm going to ask Gray to put a link in the chat so that you can read this excellent Twitter thread from Science Vet 2 from October. This is all about biological sex. He explains this all beautifully in detail, and I'm going to sum it up badly right now for you. What he's telling us is that all the things we were taught about binaries around sex when we were young and in school is at best and most charitably incomplete. Even biologically, even biologically, there are people who have XX chromosomes who are in every way functionally, functionally male. And some people who have XY chromosomes who are in every way functionally female. And that's before we ever get to the more unusual configurations such as XXY and, and other unusual configurations. But we have been conditioned to believe that there are only two genders, that they match people's physical sexual characteristics and also our genetic makeup. We need to unlearn a lot of what we were taught as fact. We need to unlearn it because it's causing harm for real people. And gender, as we learned earlier, earlier is something different altogether from physical characteristics. Gender is who we know ourselves to be. Many of us have a gender that matches the sex that we were assigned at birth and also matches how others perceive us in the world. However, this is not true for everyone. And this is not a new phenomenon. This, this has been true for ages. We know more people who are trans and non-binary now 
because it's safer to come out now than it has been in the past. But it is not a new phenomenon. I am a cisgender woman. That means my gender matches the gender I was assigned at birth. And I present as a woman. I have always known myself to be female. Therefore, I invited my trans and non-binary colleagues to share anything they would like you to know. My colleague, the Reverend Paul Langston Daly shared this about interacting with trans and non-binary people. He said, don't assume anything and ask questions that are aligned with the level or depth of your relationship. So if your relationship isn't deep, don't be asking about surgery. And he says, also, while I appreciate that your grandson is trans, you don't need to lead with that. In other words, that is not a person's entire identity as if you are cisgender, your being male or female is not your entire identity. He says, there might be, there might be a lot of other things you have in common. Maybe you like the same books or movies. And finally, he says this, we are not tragic one-dimensional cardboard cuts, nor are we tragic three-dimensional characters from TV and film. Yes, some of us are broken, just like every other demographic. We are also strong, proud, shy, loving, cautious, carefree, lovable, smart, and beautiful, just like every other demographic. I've invited Gray Simpson to speak to us from their personal experience. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Gray, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs, and he, him, his. Uh, I'm equally comfortable with both sets of pronouns. And the best word that I know of uh, that describes my gender, which I just learned about a year ago, is uh, demi-male. So literally, I think that means part, partly male, partly something else. Now, just be, now because I present more masculine with this uh, chiseled jawline and a rich tenor voice, uh, almost everyone refers to me as he, and that's 100% okay with me, uh, at least right now. Uh, but I have to say, I do get a little spark of joy uh, when someone refers to me as they, uh, because when that happens, I know that person really accepts me. Now, if having two sets of pronouns seems confusing to you, just know that it's confusing to me too. Understanding my identity has been a confusing process. Deciding how to come out or whether to come out at all was complicated. I wanted to make sure I was coming out for the right reasons for myself and in a way that was respectful towards those who don't have the privileges that I have as someone who passes as cisgender male without that being a source of pain. And yes, staying on top of all these uh, confusing uh, new words and uh, unfamiliar concepts uh, takes work, but it's worth the effort. Gender is complex. It can be complex in an embarrassing way, like when I forget to use my coworkers' correct pronouns. Mm -hmm. It can be complex in an irritating way, like how a friend of mine felt that uh, our other coworker was just using special pronouns to get attention. Um, and for a lot of people, it's confusing in a threatening way, inspiring defensiveness and anger and even hatred. Uh, but I find that diversity, even and especially when it defies understanding, is beautiful. And I'm glad that we can celebrate diversity together. Thank you so much, Gray. Using someone's proper pronouns reduces the risk of suicide and self-harm. Please use people's chosen pronouns. And a word about dead naming. What is dead naming? When someone comes out and chooses a new name, their old name is what's known now as their dead name. It might have very painful associations. Please, please don't ever dead name someone, not in front of them and not in their absence. 
On this, the day after the Trans Day of Remembrance, let us remember the harm that cisgender people have caused. And let us commit to doing better. It's holy work. We will truly be affirming and promoting the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Now, you will note that I put my pronouns after my name. I know that people will assume that I'm a woman. I don't do this because I'm afraid people won't know I'm a woman. I do this to normalize using pronouns so that people who need to tell us what their pronouns are aren't stigmatized by having to do that. I invite you to use your pronouns, even if it's something you haven't thought about before. If this is a privilege you carry, I invite you as an ally to put your pronouns after your name. I see that some of us already do that as I look through the list of participants in our worship service. That's another way, a small way that we can support one another. Let us truly affirm and promote the inherent dignity of every person. Let us continue to remember so that we don't keep causing harm. Let us continue to remember so that we don't need to continue to hold more and more solemn memorials. Let us continue to remember so that we may celebrate each and every one of us in the fullness of who we are. Beloveds, I see you for who you are. Namaste.